All right, um, this is 5.3. Um, I want to remind you that in 5.1, we talked about um, basically how to find critical points, and we talked about how to use a table to discover whether a critical point was a minimum or maximum. And it was kind of a pain because what we did was we set uh, f prime equal to zero, and we set f prime equal to undefined. And from this, we got you know x equals c1, x equals c2, let's say. And then let's say that over here you found that x equals c3. And then what you had to do is you had to put a table together like this. And you would plug in a, c1, c2, c3, and b. And you'd basically find the f values here, f of a, f of c1, f of c2, f of c3, and f of b. And you were looking for largest and smallest. OK. Now, um, that was the idea. And I wouldn't say it's hard to do, but I would say that it was a little bit um, a little bit frustrating that you have to use so many points at the table. So today what I'd like to do is um, kind of gather up some theorems and some tricks that might help us um, to identify mins and maxes a little more efficiently. And also, we want to talk about a couple of new ideas regarding um, the second derivative. So 5.3, you could say, is sort of an enhanced version of um, 5.1. And 5.2, if you remember, was mean value theorem. So that's really not, um, not that relevant to the, what I'm doing today. So let's talk about 5.3. And uh, we're going to start with something called um, a concavity. Okay, this is a bit of a, a mature notion, but I want you to think about something with me here. You'll notice that when we draw a graph, there are two places we can put it above the x axis, and we can put it below the x-axis, right? Think about that. When you draw a graph, you can draw a graph up here, or you can draw a graph down here. Of course, you could, you know, draw a graph like this as well. And then you would have to be a little more careful how you talk about it. You would just say, all right, well, part of it is above the x-axis and part of it is below. So you'd identify, you know, okay, this part is below. This part is above, right? But my point is, there's two ways it could be. So when f is above, we call it f is positive. When f is below the x-axis, we call it f is negative. And that's always that's always been what it meant, because um, f is below the x-axis means y is zero. And if the y coordinates are zero, then f is zero. F is, sorry, I said the wrong. If f is below the x-axis, then the y coordinates are negative. And if the y coordinates are negative, then f is negative, because f means y, right? Same thing here, if these points are above the x-axis, right, then we would just simply say that the y's are positive. Or you could say that f is greater than zero, same thing. Okay. That being said, there are also two ways to tilt a graph. So we could make a graph rise or we can make it fall. So that's another thing we could do. So we can make a graph rise or we can make a graph fall. Right? If it's rising, it could look like this or this. If it's falling, so we call this uh, F increasing is one way to say it. So you can say f is rising, or you can say f is increasing. Um, 
and then polling could look, you know, like one of these. So this is F is decreasing. Or you could say falling. Right? Okay, but there's still more to talk about. You could also draw a graph arched this way or arched this way. So this is sort of um, cupping, kind of a cupped graph. And this is sort of upside down cupped graph. So this is sort of up cupped. And this is sort of down cupped on the right. Okay, so there's really multiple things we could do to a graph. We can make it placed above the x-axis. We can place it below the x-axis. After choosing where to put it, we can make it rising, or we can make it falling. So we can make it rising above the x-axis, or we can make it rising below the x-axis. We can make it falling above the x-axis or falling below the x-axis. Right? We can also make it curve this way above the x-axis, curve this way below the x-axis, curve this way above the x-axis, or curve this way below the x-axis. So there's kind of six ways it could go. So f is greater than zero would be a graph up here. Right? F is less than zero would be a graph down here. Above the x-axis could also look like this. Below the x-axis could also look like this. And this is F is greater than zero, F is less than zero. So there's above versus below. Speaking of the x-axis. Or we could rise, fall, or cup up, cup down. OK, this cupping effect is new. So let's talk about that. OK, it's not called cupping, actually. This is called concave up. But it looks kind of like a cup, right? You could probably put water in that thing. And then this is called concave down. One easy way to remember this is that a concave up graph will be one of the three features in orange on this emoji. Okay, so if you look at his eyebrows and his mouth, that's concave up graph. Concave down graph would be one of the three orange features in this drawing. Okay, this is a nice, easy way to remember. Okay, please do not draw this picture. Please do not draw this picture. As cute as he is, uh, that one is not allowed. Remember, it looks like Charlie Brown, and Charlie Brown is almost never happy. Okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll try to make this guy look like, more like a sad Charlie Brown. He's, he's really hardly ever happy. Okay. okay, so the reason this is important is because concave up and down has not really been discussed, but it is quite useful to know. So let's take an example. Let's say that I had a function that was like this, and it was 3x to the fourth minus 6x squared plus 1. 
and let's say that you wanted to know what it looked like. Well, you could just graph it on Desmos. It looks like this. And what's really good news about this is the features are all there. This, this just has all the right features. Okay. It's got pieces that go downhill. So we, we've been calling that um, falling. Or you could call it decreasing. And we're, of course, describing the graph. Remember, we read our graphs from left to right. Right? Then it rises. So that's F is rising or uphill. That's F is rising. Or you could say F is increasing. And then we have another decreasing region. And then we have another increasing region. So it's basically got all the goodies there, some of each. And you can see that there's two ways to think about this point here. One way to think about that point, and by the way, that of course is a relative minimum. One way to think about that point is to think of it as On the left side, the slope is negative, and the right side at that point, the slope is positive. Okay? In fact, you could actually prove that very easily. Watch. If you find a derivative, pretty easy to do. You could find the critical points. Remember, critical values, critical numbers, critical points. You just set f prime equal to zero, and you set f prime equal to undefined. This gives you A nice chance to factor for this first calculation. And we get three distinct x's. And these are the critical points so far. And we come over here to this other calculation. Accurate. And sorry, the right side here should say undefined. Sorry about that. And this is just a dead end. You cannot have a polynomial that produces an undefined. To get undefined, you need to have like radicals or fractions, rationals or radicals. Okay, so we found three critical points. They're all type 1. And what you'll notice about these is if you draw a number line, and you put these on here, these three numbers separate the x-axis into four regions. And if you title this f prime, and if you test each of the four regions, so over here we'll test maybe x equals negative 2. You can plug that into the derivative. And we got a negative number. Over here we could test maybe x equals negative half. So if you test x equals negative half,
think you get negative three fourths here. This comes out to positive four point five. We don't really care about the 4.5. We do care that this is positive. And if you come over here and you test x equals half, it's basically the same calculation, except it's 12 times half times 3 fourths minus, times 1 fourth minus 1. So in other words, it's 6 times negative 3 fourths. So it's negative 4.5. Again, we don't care about the 4.5, we just care about the negative. And then over here we could test x equals 2, which is 12 times 2 times 4 minus 1. And we get positive 72. Notice we don't care about the 72s and the 4.5s, we care about the positives and the negatives. What we've just learned is that f prime, which is positive, here, this means that the F graph is increasing. So when F prime is positive, F is increasing. And when F prime is negative, when F prime is negative, that means F is decreasing. And so we can see that this graph, if you read it from left to right, like we always do, it reads decrease, increase, decrease, increase. And that's exactly what we saw in this picture, right? It was down, up, down, up. So this proves really that that orange, that yellow dot is a minimum. It also proves at the same time that this one's a maximum. And this one here is a minimum. So we kind of get a lot of information from this little sign chart. This little sign chart really helps us to identify this and this as rel min, and this one is a rel max. And so we're going to make a, a little statement here. We're going to make a little rule. We're going to use it from now on. And it basically says if f prime changes from negative to positive, negative to positive, at a critical point, then F has a rel max at that critical point. And of course, uh, if it changes from you know positive to negative, then that'd be a rel max. I actually said this one wrong. This one's a relative minimum. Excuse me. The next sentence is for relative maximum. So if it changes from positive to negative at a critical point. then f has a rel max at that critical point. So this is called first derivative test for extrema. And it's pretty handy. Um, I usually just make a sign chart. Wherever it changes from negative to positive, that's a min. Wherever it changes from positive to negative, that's a max. It's pretty neat. Um, and I remember the first time I learned them, I was excited to go and use them and see if I could get my sign charts to match my graphs. Notice we're usually supposed to do the sign chart first and then sketch the graph. Because there's not always, you know, we're not always that familiar with the graph, but we just happen to know this one from Algebra 2. 
Okay, so that's one way to think of those critical points, those um, mins and maxes. But there's kind of another way to look at all of this. If the graph really does look like this, nice and smooth, no sharp turns, and if we have a critical point here, and a critical point here, and a critical point here, isn't it also true that we could look at it this way? This piece of graph is happy. And then right in here somewhere, I'm not sure where, the graph suddenly turns sad. And then somewhere again, it changes back to happy. So this is happy. And this over here is happy. And this piece here is more sad. In other words, it seems to me like this green piece could have come from this guy's smile. This green piece could have come from that guy's smile. And I'm pretty sure that that middle piece comes from the guy's frown. Okay, so what that implies is that we could use the concavities or the cupping effect to investigate these points. It seems like minima will occur in a happy region and maximum will occur in a sad region. So the mins belong to the green and the max belongs to the red. So let's write another sentence. If a graph is concave up at a critical point, then uh, F has a minimum. at that critical point of course there's the counter argument the um, other case if a graph is concave down at a critical point then f has a and let's not say minimum and maximum. Let's say rel min and rel max okay, at that critical point. And this is a um, second derivative test. We call this the second derivative test. Now you might want to say, why do you call this a derivative test? Well, I'm not. I'm not calling it a derivative test. It's a second derivative test. Well, does that mean that it's the second time we've done the derivative test? No. When I say second derivative here, I'm actually talking about F double prime. So that's an adjective applied to the word derivative, not to the word test. You might say, what does concave up and concave down have anything to do with second derivative? So I want to show you something else. Do you remember how the derivative was 12x, x plus, well, it was basically 12x cubed minus 12x, remember? I want to show you something. If you find the second derivative, so recall f prime. Now find f double prime. Watch what happens. f double prime equals 36x squared minus 12, right? And if you look closely at the roots for this one, oops, let's do zero first. 
So if we set f double prime equal to zero, and we set f double prime equal to und, we can pull out a 12 here. And this is a little bit of a weird factoring, but bear with me. Um, notice that um, I this x is not inside the square root. So this is x root 3. And this one is also x root 3. You'll notice that you solve this one like that. And when you solve this one, actually, let me use my red pen. When you solve this one, you get negative 1 over root 3. When you solve this one, you get 1 over root 3. Notice that this number and this number are probably important somehow on the graph. So, any guesses what they might be? If you guessed point of inflection, you're probably right. Let's do a little sign chart. So remember when we made the sign chart before? This will be an F double prime sign chart. So I'm going to put on negative root 3 over 3 and root 3 over 3. By the way, this is approximately uh, it's 1.7 over 3. So you can just think of it as point, point 0.55 or something. It's approximately 0.5. Okay. Now what you're going to do is you're going to test the three regions like we did last time. Last time it was four regions. So let's... Um, Let's do this. Let's test x equals, so this was negative 0.5. Let's test x equals negative 1. Then we'll test x equals 0. And then we'll test x equals 1. Notice we're plugging this into the second derivative. So you can use the factored form, or you can use the mid-factored form, or you can use the form, the original, doesn't matter. I'm going to use the original. So you just basically plug in to 36x squared minus 2. And this gives us positive 34. Plug in 0. the negative, and plug in 1. So in other words, since f prime was 36x squared minus 2, we just basically tested this little sign chart. Do you remember when we said that the graph was happy, sad, happy? That's what these signs mean. We said the graph was happy, sad, and then happy again. Now, these points are very special. They are not mins and maxes, but they are intermediary points between happiness and sadness. They're mood change points. And so it's probably important to note them in our final analysis. Okay, let's take a look at the question again. The question said, if you go back to the original problem, well, the instructions weren't very clear. I should have made the instructions clear. It would be find extrema and points of inflection. Also declare all regions 
of increasing and decreasing. Concave up. Concave down. Okay, so let's go ahead and write our final analysis. So what we learned after all things are said and done, as we learned, that F has a relative minimum at x equals 1 and x equals negative 1. So let's put them in that order. Actually, let's put negative 1 first. Also, F has a real max at x equals 0. We also learned that F is decreasing from negative infinity to negative 1. So you could say negative infinity comma negative 1. Now remember, you can say f deke, or you can say f prime neg. Same thing. This means the same thing. Okay? We also know that um, it's increasing. From negative 1 to 0. So from negative 1 to 0. This is called f decreasing. Uh, in increasing, excuse me, but you can also call it f prime pause. And that's the, this region right here. Then f decreases again. from 0 to 1. So you can write it like this, or you could write it like this, right? So you can use any qualities, or you could use intervals notation. And that's called um, f decreasing. We could say f prime negative. And then lastly, f is increasing again from 1 to infinity. So 1 is less than x is less than infinity, where f is increasing again, or you could say f prime is positive. OK? You could say f has a point of inflection. which that's kind of a hard word to write out. So next time you can just write POI if you want. And that's at x equals negative root 3 over 3. And another at x equals root 3 over 3. OK, you could say that f is concave up between negative root 3, that's false, between negative infinity and negative root 3 over 3. So basically negative infinity, negative root 3 over 3. You can call that f is concave up. You can also call that f double prime is positive. And you can also call f prime increasing if you want. Interesting. Then you can say f is concave down. Between negative root 3 over 3 and positive root 3 over 3. So negative root 3 over 3, positive root 3 over 3. F is concave 
down, you could say f double prime is negative, or you could say f prime is decreasing. They're all the same meaning. And then lastly, f is concave up again. between root 3 over 3 and infinity. So root 3 over 3 infinity. F is concave up. You could say F double prime is positive, or you could say F prime is increasing. Whew. And that's the final analysis of that quartic function. A final very accurate sketch would be fall, rise, fall, rise. This is negative one, comma something, and this is zero, comma something, and this is one, comma something. And then right here, and right here, these are also special points. And what's so special about those points? Those are special because the graph changes from smile to frown at those locations. So this part of the graph is happy. And so is this. And then this part of the graph is sad. So there's a couple ways to split this graph up using the um, orange rises and falls. Or, at, uh, or using the pink and purple um, smiles and frowns. Now, any point we pick, right, x equals negative 1, negative root 3 over 3, 0, root 3 over 3, or 1, they all, of course, have their own y-coordinates. So if you want to get their y-coordinates, always use f to get y-coordinates. Okay. I think that's obvious. I think that's pretty obvious. So if you plug in negative 1, remember the original function. Um, I don't even remember it. What was it? It was the 3x to the 4th, 6x squared into 1. Yes, it's basically 3 times negative 1 to the 4th minus 6 times negative 1 squared plus 1. That gives me 3 minus 6 plus 1, which is 4 minus 6, which is negative 2. If you find f of negative root 3 over 3, this is 3 times 9 80 firsts. Minus 6 times 9 ninths, 3 ninths, plus 1. We could say 1 third minus 2 plus 1, which is really 4 thirds minus 2, which is negative 2 thirds. I hope I did that right. I think that's right. Yeah, pretty sure. Yeah. And then due to the symmetry, um, this would also be a negative two thirds and a negative two. And then there's one more point to find right here. And that's x equals zero. And f of zero, that's obvious. That's obviously 1.
So that's the y coordinate of the middle point. So this technique is called analysis of a curve, but you could also call it curve sketching technique because we can use these techniques to draw the curve very accurately, but we can also use these techniques to test the curve. We learned that this is a minimum for two different reasons. It's in a happy region and it's also fall rise. This is a maximum because it's in a sad region and it's a rise fall. And this is like the first point on the far left. It is in a fall rise region and it is also in a happy region, which makes it a minimum. Now I want to make a little warning here. I want to give you a little warning. This second derivative test cannot really be used on a sharp turn. So if your graph happens to have a sharp turn like this, or like this, or like this, you can't really use the second derivative test on that, okay? So don't, don't use it on that. The first derivative test does work. It does work on a sharp turn. So if your graph looks like this, or maybe like this, or like this, um, you can use the first derivative test if you like, okay? So everything I've shown you today is almost optional, except for this, um, these new emojis, okay? These new emojis, here, these two. The happy and the sad emojis are a very important part of this lesson. And they teach us, basically, that graphs also have a curvature to them. And that's kind of a big deal in 5.3, maybe even more important than identifying mins and maxes and testing them with sign charts. Okay, we're going to do one more um, function here. And it's basically just a little bit simpler question. And that is um, find the points of inflection. And there's a part A. And there's a part B. And there's a part C. OK. Um, since we're only finding points of inflection, it would probably be good enough to jump straight to second derivative and set up a sign chart. So that's what we're going to do. So the first derivative is e to the minus x squared times negative 2x from the chain rule. In other words, it's negative 2x e to the negative x squared. And the second derivative If you're looking at this, you will need the product rule. Okay. Move this down a little bit. All right, um, real quick, let's take a closer look at this. Let's pull out, uh, let's make a negative 2. I just want to make sure I, I do those derivatives correctly. Nope, I didn't. Let me try that again. The derivative of 2x is 2, negative 2. x is, the derivative of negative 2x is negative 2. And then careful here. The derivative of e to the minus negative e to the minus x squared is negative e to the minus x squared times another negative 2x. And there's another negative 2x from earlier. So we basically end up with a minus 4x squared e to the minus x squared. Okay, I always like to factor whenever possible. I'll pull out a negative e to the negative x squared. I'll even pull out a 2. So I'm basically pulling out this whole first term. So I just get 1 minus, uh, plus 2x. 
but I think I got that right. I'm not sure. Let me double check my work. First derivative in purple is correct. And boy, that's tricky. Hold on. I think I got that right. Okay, so we got this it's all set up. Something's not quite right. Let me back up a little bit. Let me redo this derivative. I don't know what I'm doing. Sorry. Okay. The derivative of negative 2x is negative 2. Then I multiply that by e to the minus x squared. Then I do a product rule, right? This is product rule. Then I do the negative 2x right here. And here's where I messed up last time. This part, the derivative of that, is e to the minus x squared times negative 2x. So this gives me a negative 2 e to the negative x squared, and then plus a 4x squared e to the minus x squared. So I think I accidentally did a minus in the middle there last time. OK, now we're going to pull out a 2 e to the negative x squared. And hopefully I did all that right. So it's negative 1 plus 2x squared. OK, a little bit awkward. Sorry about that. But another negative. Uh, let's, let's leave the negative inside, but we'll reverse the way we wrote it. So it's 2x squared minus 1. OK, that was a bit awkward. So what now? Well. Let's write it like this one more time. I was going to make a sign chart, but first I got to set f prime equal to zero and undefined. So I'm going to set f double prime I mean, equal to zero and undefined. Notice I already put the um, e on the bottom, so you don't need a negative power anymore. Uh, when a fraction is equal to 0, it's because the top is equal to 0. So this gives me 2x squared equals 1, and x squared is half, and that's x equals plus or minus 1 over root 2. Okay, we also always test f double prime equals und, but that means when a fraction is undefined, uh, that means that the bottom is 0. But I don't think 2e to the x squared can equal 0. That's not possible. OK, but that's good news. That just means it's a dead end. We often see that. You'll notice this happens quite often. OK, you get one type of CP, but not the other. So what we're doing right now is the um, second derivative roots and poles. OK, now let's make a sign chart. The only numbers I got were negative 1 over root 2 and positive 1 over root 2. And it's always important that you can title your sign chart. So if it's second derivative, title it f double prime. OK, this is going to be very uh, educational. OK, 
So this is really negative root 2 over 2. Or you could just put in decimals. It's um, 0.7s. Okay, 0.7s. This is like 0 0.707, and this is 0 0.707. One's negative, one's positive. So let's just test x equals negative 1, 0, and 1. Okay, when you test negative 1, make sure you plug it into the second derivative. This is 2 times negative 1 squared minus 1 over 2 e to negative 1 squared, which sounds complicated, but it's actually quite easy. The top is basically 2 minus 1, so it's 1, and the bottom is just 2e. Now, you might not know what is 2e. You might not know what is 1 over 2e, but one thing's for sure. It's a positive number, and that's what you need, really needed to know. Plugging in 0, this just gives us negative 1 over 2, but most importantly, a negative number. If we test x equals 1, This just brings us back to getting 1 over 2e, which we've decided is a positive number. So why is this important? Well, you can see that this part, this means f is concave up, f is concave down, f is concave up again. In other words, the graph is smiling frowning, smiling. Now, don't take that too literally, okay? When we say concave up, it doesn't have to be a full-blown smile. It could just be the eyebrows from the happy man. Okay? So you, you never know, is it the mouth or the eyebrows? So keep that in mind. This is why the eyebrows are important. So either we're going to glue their mouths together, or their eyebrows, or eyebrows and mouths. Um, actually, on this particular graph, I believe it's the eyebrow from the left part of this guy. And then it's glued to the mouth in the middle guy. And then it's glued to the right eyebrow of this guy. Now, I know that from experience, but that's the basic shape of F, okay? Um, if you don't believe me, you could go test F prime, and you'll see it goes basically rise, fall. There's only one rise and one fall region. Okay, but my point, my point is not really to study the graph. Actually, I don't really need to know this graph. Right? What I needed was the points of inflection, which would be right here. Remember, the points of inflection are the points between the moods. So we have happiness and sadness, and the point of inflection is the point in between those. So I'm just going to go with x equals negative root 2 over 2, and x equals root 2 over 2. Final answer. Okay, let's take a look at this next one. Again, it's points of inflection, so we have to get busy. So we have to find the second derivative, like we did last time. So f prime would be a quotient rule. And you would plug in 1 prime, 1 plus x squared. 1 plus x squared prime, and a 1. And then a 1 plus x squared gets plugged in here. So this gives us 0 times 1 plus x squared minus 2x times 1. 
And this is a little bit complicated, but it's just basically this part cancels out. Lucky us. So we end up with negative 2x over 1 plus x squared squared. But this is no use to us because we're studying points of inflection. So we have to go find the second derivative now. So to find the second derivative, we're going to need the quotient rule again. So we'll put negative 2x prime, 1 plus x squared squared, 1 plus x squared squared, and then negative 2x, and then 1 plus x squared squared squared. <laughs> okay. Notice this is just negative 2. This is basically 1 plus 2x squared plus x to the fourth, if you foil it, minus, then we have a 1 plus x squared, so, well, let's, for this part, let's just foil it first, and then we'll, we'll do the derivative later. So I'm not going to do the apostrophe yet. I don't really care about the bottom right now. I'm going to move this problem real quick. Get more space. Forgot how long this one takes. So hopefully you copy that right. This gives us negative 2 minus 4x squared minus 2x to the fourth. Um, this part here, we haven't found the derivative yet. So that's just 0 plus 4x plus 4x cubed. 0 plus 4x plus 4x cubed. So we basically end up with a 4x plus 4x cubed and a negative 2x is there, remember? So you can check my work later. Alright, so we end up with a positive 4x squared and a positive 8x to the fourth. Now I don't care too much about the bottom. I'm going to clean up the top. So this cancels with this. And these combine to make 6x to the fourth. Okay. Now we're going to set this equal to 0 and undefined. I'll, I'll go ahead and write the denominator. The denominator is 1 plus x squared squared squared. Okay, so we're going to set this equal to 0. And we're going to set this equal to undefined. This time, let's do the undefined part first. This is a dead end. And the reason is the bottom cannot equal 0. It's not possible for the bottom to equal 0. It's just a bunch of squared stuff. So it could be a positive number, maybe, but it can't be 0. Oh, by the way, I think up here I, I accidentally wrote f double prime equals un, this should be f double prime equals und, which means that the bottom is 0. Sorry if that was confusing. OK. So when you get to here, this looks like a really hard problem. But this one's a dead end. And this one, you just take the top, and you get a perfectly meaningful answer. A little bit tricky, but it's plus or minus the fourth root of one third. The fourth root of one third. Okay. Now um, we're supposed to go make a sign chart, right? And we're supposed to put negative fourth root of one third.
and positive fourth root of one third. But we can just test b zero that, that x equals negative one, x equals zero, x equals one again. Remember from last time? And this time it's easier than last time. Because our first derivative, our second derivative is always positive on the bottom anyway. It's always positive on the bottom. Since it's always positive on the bottom, we'll just take a look at the top. So it's 6 times negative 1 to the 4th minus 2 over something positive. And that's just basically 6 minus 2 over something positive, which is 4 over something positive. So this part is definitely positive. This one you do 6 times 0 to the 4th minus 2 over something positive, which is just 0 minus 2 over something positive, which is negative 2 over something positive. And then we're going to plug in 1. And that's just basically 6 minus 2 over positive, 4 over positive. So that is also positive. And so we can see, without further ado, that the concavity changes from positive to negative and from negative to positive at these two points. So the points of inflection are at x equals negative 4th root of 1 third and positive 4th root of 1 third. So negative and positive, fourth root of one third. And I want to remind you, when you rationalize these, um, you want to multiply top and bottom by 27 on the inside. And the reason is you need four sets of three on the bottom. So basically, um, fourth root of one third. Let me figure that out real quick. Fourth root of one third. So in order to get this rationalized, it's 1 over the fourth root of 3. So what you want to do is multiply the bottom by uh, fourth root 27 here and here. And that gives you fourth root of 27 all over fourth root of 81. So that's another way to write it. It's the fourth root of 27 over 3. All right. Um, okay, so there you have it. And then um, you'll notice that we'll probably want to graph these in the end. Okay, one more. So for this last one, I'm going to find the derivative twice. And then again. And notice I didn't need chain rule, really, because the derivative of the inside happens to be 1. So there's no reason to use chain rule. OK. Mm, did I get that right? I think I got that right. OK. Now we're going to set this equal to 0. And we're going to set this equal to undefined. So we get this. This one doesn't make sense though, this first one, because here you have this cubed root of x minus 1 to the fifth down here. It's impossible for this to equal 0, because there's no x's upstairs. But it could be possible. In fact, it is perfectly possible for this to be undefined. if x is 1. So this is a rare case where we get this second type of um, result and not a first type of result. Usually it's a dead end on the first one, on the second one. Okay, now we're going to draw our sign chart. 
and we only need to plug in two numbers. We'll pick x equals negative 1, or let's just do x equals 0 and 2. How's that? x equals 0, x equals 2. We're going to plug it into the second derivative. Okay. So here we go. Plugging in 0, we get this. Which gives me this, which gives me this, which gives me a positive. Plugging in 2, Gives me this. Which is negative. Okay, now, what's interesting about this graph is it has only one critical point, or one uh, point of inflection. And x equals 1. Now we have to be a little bit careful with all this analysis. We've done uh, three problems in a row, finding POIs. And let's go back and take a close look at the actual graphs. Okay? So e to the minus x squared, if you graph it on a graphing calculator, it's actually a pretty famous function. It's the bell curve famous bell curve. And it is 100% true that there's a point of inflection there and a point of inflection there. I believe these were the um, root 3 over 3. Root 3 over 3, if I remember correctly. We go back and look. Uh, no, sorry. Those are the root 2 over 2s. My bad. Okay. And the graph has a nice tangent line right there. Tangent line right there. But more importantly, the graph changes from happy to sad to happy at those points. Okay, the second graph was this one. Which has a very similar look, actually. It's not a bell curve, but it's pretty darn close. This one's actually not quite as famous. I guess you could say it's the derivative of arctan, but that's not, that's not what I'm talking about right now. So this one is the one that gave us the more awkward answers. Negative fourth root of one third, positive fourth root of one third. And these also have tangent lines. And the graph changes from happy to sad to happy at those points. The third one the third one was this one. It was the x minus 1 to the 1 third plus 4. And this one takes a little more care. And the reason I want to draw this one carefully is because it's got a special feature. Notice y equals x cubed looks like this. y equals cube root of x looks like this. It's just the inverse. So that's x to the one-third. If we shift that one right four, I mean shift right one and up four, we get this very interesting graph.
Okay. So what's so interesting about it? Well, one thing that's interesting is that this really is a point of inflection. Just like we said, point of inflection x equals 1. The graph changes from happy. It's this guy's left eyebrow. Basically, it's this guy's left eyebrow. And then it changes to sad on the other side of the graph. It's this guy's left eyebrow again. So it's this guy's left eyebrow combined with this guy's left eyebrow. Notice that what's interesting here is there's a tangent line that's straight up and down. So the tangent line is vertical. Which means f prime is zero. No, sorry, f prime is actually um, undefined. And so is f double prime, remember? F double prime was also undefined at that point. So it's okay to have a vertical tangent and call that a point of inflection in certain cases. Okay, real quick. A couple little things. Um, a point of inflection has a very specific definition. It's a point where F double prime is zero or undefined A tangent line must exist at that point. Okay, so this gives us another rule. If F has, sorry, if F double prime equals zero or undefined at a point and if a tangent line can be drawn at that point so exists at that point F has a point of inflection there at that point. It's kind of a specific definition and a specific rule. It has to have two features. It has to have f double prime is zero or und. Actually, it has to have three features. I'll explain the third feature in a minute. It has to have a tangent line. Interesting. Um, also, the, the f double prime has to actually change signs. So um, let me put this in correctly where f double prime changes signs. Move this down a little bit. So it has to, oops, it has to actually changes signs. And that means basically f prime will be zero or undefined. So it's kind of a long definition. Sorry about that. I missed, I miswrote it the first time. So it has to ch f prime has to change from positive to negative, or from negative to positive. That means f prime is going to be zero or undefined, and f there must be a tangent line. So let me let me fix this second sentence as well. If f double prime changes signs, and f double prime is zero. Or undefined, at a point, at that same point, and if tangent line exists at that same point, then f has a point of inflection at that same point. So this definition is very strict. What it means is, let's say you have a happy, happy man, and a sad man. And let's say you wanted to take um, the guy's, the first guy's eyebrow here and combine it with this eyebrow here. 
So this is happy, and this is sad, right? So you put those together. But is this a point of inflection? No. It is not a point of inflection. Why not? The reason is, even though it changes from happy to sad, right, even though it changes from happy to sad, at this point, you can't draw a tangent line there because there's no tangent line. Okay, so what if you took, um, what if you took this guy's left eyebrow and combined it with this other guy's left eyebrow, like this? Oops, I did that wrong. Okay, even if you did this, you have to be very careful. Because what if, what if it looked like that? See? So you're taking this guy's left eyebrow and this guy's left eyebrow. Well, it's on our left. And you put that in like that. This goes from happy to sad. But is it a point of inflection? No, again, it's not a point of inflection. There's no tangent line. It's got to be perfectly smooth. So it's okay for it to be like this. As long as it's perfectly smooth. It's even okay if it's straight up and down. Even though there's no even though the tangent line is slope undefined, but it's got to have a tangent line. That's very important. That's very, very important. So this would be a yes. This would be a yes. These are poise. Okay. It's also to go, possible to go from sad to happy. So you can go from like sad to happy or even sad, that's the guy's mouth, to happy. As long as it connects in a smooth sort of way and a tangent line can be constructed there. Even if, even if it's flat, any kind of tangent line. Okay, last comment, I promise. Last comment. The poise and and mins and maxes, you cannot use inverse logic to get them. So for example, if I say um, a poi can exist where f double prime is zero, that doesn't mean a poi will always exist where f double prime is zero. For example, let's say that um, I gave you f equals x minus 3 to the, or 2x minus 3 to the fourth power, and you found the derivative. So you've got the 4 down, put the 3 up top, so you took away power. Don't forget the chain rule on this one. And then you found the second derivative. Again, don't forget the chain rule. You have a little 2x on the inside there, so you need to find the derivative of that. Okay, so this gives you negative 48 times 2x minus 3 squared. And then you set this equal to 0. And you set this equal to undefined. Let's say. And you're working hard. And for this one, you get x equals 3 halves. And for this one, you, it's a dead end. OK, so we're just to do both searches. So this is a dead end. This x equals 3 halves is your only candidate for poi. I mean, uh, yeah, for poi. 
but that doesn't mean it's a poi. So watch this. So you put three halves on here, and let's say you test x equals 0, and you test x equals 2. So you plug these into your derivative. Second derivative, excuse me. This gives you negative 48 times 9, which is negative 432. So the sign's negative. Then you plug in positive 2 for your other part of the test. And you get negative 48. Hmm. Notice there's no change. There's no change in sign. This problem has no poise. So I don't want you to get the impression that when I say a poise can exist where f double prime is zero, I'm not saying it has to exist where f double prime is zero. Same thing with und. If f double prime is und, it could be a poise. That doesn't mean it is a poise. And the same is true for mins and maxes. Right? Mins and maxes were like that too back in 5.1. Sorry for the long lesson.